And we're back with another edition of Hacking TV. This week, Comcast is not being strangled by cord cutters yet. And more world news from the world of earnings. Then, YouTube's hit-making team, the Fine Brothers, stepped into a world of hurt. And is a, there a world of hurt all through the Sumner Redstone Viacom CBS uh, empire? Uh, we will see whether war is about to break out. I'm Steve Rosenbaum. And I'm Saul Hansel. And this is Hacking TV for Super Bowl Sunday. Indeed. So, so we're going to have a super show. That's right. And, and by probably, next year, people yeah. are not going to be interested in Super Bowl ads. They're going to be watching the incredible creative dynamic ads on Hacking TV, which we don't have yet, but they're on the roadmap, as they say. That, that may be the ultimate uh, contradiction in terms. Incredible dynamic ads. It's the only kind of ads that anyone's ever going to watch from now on. Is that so. like healthy, delicious McDonald's? Yes. <laughs> Which is the only way McDonald's is going to save itself. So, right? We so, live in a world of choices. So so a big chunk of last week's show was devoted to, uh, to the earnings week stuff. And I think we ought to just swing back through. We've got a couple more um, big plays in the earnings space that I want to just make sure we don't miss. Um, Comcast... Big, big surprise. Excellent numbers, particularly in cable. You know, so we're pulling out some interesting numbers. So the interesting number from Comcast is 89,000, which is how many actual net new video subscribers they had. That's not a very big number, but since everybody already has cable um, and everyone thinks that the trend is moving towards cord cutting, the fact that they're up, not down, and up even more than some people thought they were going to be, is interesting. Um, they won't say how many of them are skinny bundles, but they're offering them like everybody. So just because they have new customers doesn't mean that they aren't being pressured by competition. And it's also worth noting that they added in the same quarter you know, 460,000 internet subscribers. So that implies that, you know, um, you know, seven out of eight new customers didn't buy video. So this is not great news for them, except of course, they make all their money on video. Or on, on the, on the, they're going to make all their money on the internet. But one can presume that Brian Roberts from, you know, going back now a number of years, five when they did the NBC deal, has a fairly sophisticated, somewhat complex strategy that says, you know, we're going to be Coke and Pepsi, right? We're going to win either way. Yeah, and that's the same thing on the bundle, right? They own one of the two wires that goes to everybody's house. I think it is actually a safe bet that no matter what happens to wireless, you can put more stuff with less congestion down a wire than over the airwaves, and so there is real value in that, and it's and there's an oligopoly rent they can charge on that. Exactly how that's going to be structured, we don't know. But hidden in the their discussion was they're putting more data caps into more cities, which means, oh, if you're just watching Netflix, you may have to buy a more expensive package from them. They will they'll get their money from you one way or the other. So. Two other announcements, two other, um, you know, earnings announcements. The New York Times came out with um, stable numbers um, and a new newsroom strategy. So, I mean, I always I mean, assume, I think you, the, you know, the New York Times is doing very well, right? So the pullout, you know, now that they've sold off, um, you know, most of the other things, the Boston Globe, regional papers, all the other stuff they have. The company is basically the New York Times. It's got a billion and a half dollars of revenue, maybe. Um, and of that, um, 400 million is digital. Half digital only subscribers and half digital ads. 400 million for a digital content business isn't bad. They say they're on track to double that to 800 million or half the co company's revenue in five years. Since running the newsroom, producing the news report costs 
$250 million a year, they've got a sustainable model. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of work to do, but that, you know, and so Dean Bacay, the the editor has launched a sort of yet another creative review to go cut some things and put more money into others, which is, you know, what they've been doing slowly and steadily all along. And, and you know, for the purposes of this podcast, clearly they're happy with video. No, they're, well, no. Video is not a part of their success story. No, no, I don't. They, I wasn't suggesting it was, but but they're they're continuing to bet on it. They're think, continue, you know, they fired everybody and are starting over. But uh, I think it so far they have a really strong story for converting newspapers into text on web pages with some very cool interactive doodads, and they have a complete strikeout in making any sense of video. Um, I, I would only, and we don't need to do it on this show because we've done it for the last couple of weeks. We'll do it again. But I got to say, I think I think their bet on VR was an outlier bet. And I think it actually paid off really look, well they, for them. I, I remember when I was working there, you know, th thinking that they were putting a lot more energy into mobile apps in a way when I thought it was a little bit more tangential. And that worked out very well for them. Their um, R&D effort... Um, does a lot of experiments and has a pretty good eye for what's going to be relevant in a couple of years. So doing experiments makes sense. They've got a good track record. So we should, you know, count that as a smart vote um, for VR. Um, and, and meanwhile, Alphabet. Google, Alphabet, right, which is Google and a bunch of money losing um, <laughs> long range bets, which is fine. It's It's entertaining. It's they're doing what they said they were going to do when they took the company public. Um, and, um, but the Google business is surprisingly doing well, right? The, the amount of money they earn per ad is plummeting. People don't pay as much on mobile. There's a lot of competition for ads. And yet their revenue is going up. Why? There's... They have a lot of ads now on mobile, so they're higher volume, even if low lower revenue. Plus, they're showing enough annoying pre rolls on YouTube, to which have much higher CPMs, to um, like pay the bill. So video is actually contributing at Google in a way that certainly isn't at the New York Times. Uh, and, and they are now they've overtaken Apple as the largest company in the world and it goes back and forth right uh it's an interesting question you know google has high margins and stuff apple is sort of a bigger company i that's an interesting um back and forth um but um but but overall in our second week in our last week of covering earnings you know, we, we don't have to talk about Tribune Company or there's a bunch of other folks doing stuff. The bottom line is n no, no, no tragic news this week. Well, no. it's also, you know, I'm no economist, but all these, this is earnings for the last quarter of 2015. There's a lot of signs things are getting a little dicey. Uh, you know, the media companies will be a six month lagging indicator because people sort of get their spend their media budgets ahead of time, certainly in the advertising space. So we will see. I, you know, it would not be a surprise if this year was harder than last year um, from a, you know, cyclical point of view. The secular trends for those you know, companies we're talking about are okay. We'll see, you know, Comcast has more competition. The New York Times is doing okay. Google, you know, is a monopoly on a couple of really nice businesses. Um, so so let's get to the to the forest fire that is now raging over at YouTube, not related to YouTube's business, by the way, only tangentially. But, um, you know, inside the content space, um, there are these two guys, um, the Fine Brothers, and uh, they made what they thought was kind of an innocent announcement um, turned out not so innocent. Um, I thought it was a great idea. I, I, I'm about to file a trademark application for the words podcast and the words TV. And, you know, because and every anybody who wants to make a podcast about TV is going to have to go um, pay us a lot of money. All right. Hold on one second. 
Okay. So before we actually get into what happened, let's right. start for some of our viewers and our listeners who don't necessarily know what what they do. Um, the the Fine Brothers have this franchise called React Videos, and and I've in preparing for this evening's uh, show, I I've watched a couple of them, so I thought I'd just start. We'll play um, a couple. So this is the first let's one. Let's we'll watch. So this is Teens React to Nirvana. This song sounds familiar. Heard the song before. It's Nirvana. This is Nirvana. Who doesn't love Nirvana? <laughs> So really, this is teens in a studio, sitting in front of a, what I assume is a green screen with some not terribly snappy graphics, and then their Nirvana video sitting in a box next to them and them responding to it. And they do this, they have kids, you know, a lot of it is people today reacting to old stuff and old people reacting to new stuff. So they have grannies reacting to rap music, they have kids reacting to old toys, like Furbies and teenagers reacting to, you know, old dead rock bands like Nirvana. And it, 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 let's, I'll just play one more. This is kids okay. react to Miranda Sings. Miranda is a, another YouTube star. Okay. So it's a little internally self-referential, but um, just worth just clipping. These, these are younger kids. Kids react to YouTube stars. This episode, Miranda Sings. Miranda sings, Miranda sings, Miranda sings. I love her! So, I mean, it, it's charming, but not, you know, not something that you and I couldn't put together in a weekend with a bunch of neighborhood kids and some cameras. It's like, I, I watched a bunch of them to see if I was missing some artistic brilliance in it. We should now explain what the controversy was. So they, this was one of several formats that these guys did. They were very popular. Um, and it does take a little bit of work to do it. So they did two things. They trademarked or applied to trademark um, a bunch of words related to React, Kids React and so on as applied to video. And they then created a licensing company React world where you would, you know, buy the graphics and format and you could make your own React videos in their style in return for a big chunk of the revenue. We are excited to announce React World, which is a first of its kind program that allows people and companies to license all our popular shows online so that anyone, even you watching right now, can create your own versions in a fully legal way and be part of a new and exciting global community. You, the YouTube community got really upset. Right, by the way, uh, that, may, that may be the understatement of the decade. Okay. The, the YouTube community went nuts. Okay. The, the Reddit community went nuts. Every, like, they lost subscribers. They, you know. Hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Yeah, lost. yeah. I mean, which is, which is really important for, 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 our, for our listeners to understand. Like, like, not, you know, people now get to vote with their feet. And those votes get cast in a very visceral way. So when you're the Fine Brothers and you make this what you think is relatively innocent announcement, hey, we're going to license React videos, and your fans go, hey, how about if we leave? And you start seeing that counter go, boop, 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 boop. That's a really bad day. Yeah. Now, sometimes you have to do that. I mean, the history of Facebook is filled with things that they did that people hated or some people vocally hated that turn out to be the essential features that everybody loves. Imagine taking the news feed out of Facebook, right? But the news feed had all this protest. So you have to, you have to be right, and they were not right. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the certainly YouTube of all things is built on what Larry Leslie would call remix, right? And and taking ideas and varying them and multiplying them, and and to sit there and to, and to say that something that they did that you know, is as old as reporting 
and they did it a particular way in trying to trademark it, it's just foolish. But here, right? let's so let's let's now play just a little bit of their rather sheepish apology because um, it's uh, it's um, it's pretty good. Hey everybody, this video is us wanting to explain some things about React World. The confusion and negative response over what this all is has been so overwhelming. And what we've realized is that we completely screwed up with how we originally talked about this. First and foremost, we're sorry for confusing people by using terminology like our React format. We were never trying to say that every video or someone reacts to something else is something we would try to control. When we referenced licensing the React format, we only meant our specific series, not the overall genre of reaction videos. We do not own the genre. And we're creators at heart. Yeah, okay. So that's them saying, oh, please, please, please come back and please let us not be over. And we really didn't mean to be so uncool. And apparently they've done other uncool things, being a little aggressive about takedown notices to other people doing remixes. And, you know, one of the things that this shows is you can take kids and turn them into little mini uh, media empires and they start acting like media companies, right? They're in the intellectual property business and they want to, you know, get every last penny out of it. And they're as rapacious as record company executives and TV executives. And that is the incentives and you know they're being pushed back now but at the end of the day it's all like animal farm well right here's, I mean, here's to me as someone who comes out of the tv business here's what's interesting to me they kept when they made the original announcement of react world they said this is going to be just like any other tv format it's going to be you know like um dancing with the stars and will you, you see those shows all over the world and somebody invents a great thing and and as i was listening to them i thought to myself Either they've got really good legal counsel and they're going to sue the hell out of everybody or they just really don't know what they're talking about. Because, and, you know, you know I can what? do you a dancing show. probably could have made a format that had enough to it and was distinct enough that maybe you could license it, right? But what they have, I mean, nice video editing, a little bit of music, you know, a couple of graphics. There's nothing in those videos that's special enough that would make me feel like I'd want to put it into the cookie cutter, but they could come up with something, right? Um, that, you know, when you look at the, the their face and you hear their voices during this apology video, it, it's pretty clear that they're just begging for their life. I, I mean, just as an aside, did you see on Facebook a couple days ago, everybody had one of those automated videos you're in honor of Friends Day? Yep, uh, I did. I... Right? It was a very slick thing where they had video of some human hands putting photographs on a pile, but they were your photographs. It was, vi it was real technology, yeah. right? You could go build something using that kind of technology where somebody mixed their creative something with something that you just you couldn't do by yourself and that might be a decent business i mean you have to have a good idea uh, look here's here's why i think the story matters because it used to be that entertainment companies made shows and audiences either watched them or didn't but you know much like we've learned when you make comcast subscribers angry or when you make you know, when you don't deliver packages on time if you're Amazon. We now live in this, you know, this two-way world. And when you, when you insult your audience, which thinks of itself as part of your community, and they decide that they don't like it, like, like you, I, we'll see, I think what they did was right. I think they're not gonna license React World and they're, they've essentially apologized, they've backed down and they've, you know, you know, dialed the whole thing back. But it isn't clear to me at what point fans simply say, you know what, moving on. Mostly, these things wash over. The history, you know, lots of people eat Tylenol, even though a mm. bunch of people died eating Tylenol, and, you know, Facebook's doing fine. If the core product still satisfies people, um, stuff like this, it's still a pretty small thing, although my... 17-year-old daughter, Claire, who 
the longtime viewer of this podcast may remember, um, was talking to me about this. So this sort of wandered into her field of vision. Um, but we'll see. So Ultimately, the big guys win. Um, so chap- chapter three. Speaking of big guys, who the, the, may win, but it's an interesting question, right? So you've got three. 92-year-old Sumner Redstone is finally giving up just a teeny-weeny bit of his control over two companies, CBS and Viacom. Um, and he allowed um, Les Moonves and Philip DeMond, the full-time chief executives of the two companies, to become executive chairman. So he becomes chairman emeritus and suggesting that there is some rudimentary succession plan. And yet, all that really is is setting the stage for sort of the vast battle when he moves on. Because 80% of the votes are controlled by a trust where warring factions within the empire have votes. And oh. it's unclear... You know, and, who's going to get fired? And, and one of the big players in the warring factions is his daughter, Sherry. His estranged daughter, Sherry. His yes. estranged daughter, Sherry. Yes. So here's let's separate out the CBS story from the Viacom story. Everyone thinks Moonves is great. Nobody thinks he shouldn't have gotten the gig. Thumbs up all around. Moonves gets to run CBS. Moving on. On the other hand, on on the Viacom side... Not the same rousing support for Dumond. Uh, Sherry does not like him. They don't get along. Uh, and Viacom's not doing very well. So, you know, as a shareholder or an audience member, you have to think to yourself, wouldn't this be the time that you might actually change it up a little bit? Um, and, and, and Dumond is, is Sumner's guy. So Sumner's not going to change. He's 92 years old, and, you know, he, um, what's in it for him? And, uh, you know, so he can let Sherry and the trustees battle it out at whatever point, you know, that's the the next thing. But it, it, it it's probably worth thinking about for a lot of the media and technology companies that have done these, like, super share systems. Uh, Facebook, Google, and so on, Amazon, there, um, it all creates stability when you have smart um, leaders in the prime of their life. They get to go run things any which way they want, but people don't live forever. And having all of the power concentrated that way creates a vulnerability that normal, boring, widely dispersed voting power, you know, the the board would do normal, boring board things and you wouldn't necessarily have this level of intrigue. Keep in mind, you could argue the Sumner battle over the internet goes back to when he sued Google over YouTube. And, you know, I had friends that were executives at Comedy Central at the time and they were basically like, you got to be kidding me. We need YouTube as a distribution outlet. We need to reach our audience. You know, and, you know, there has been inside that company, uh, you know, a frozen with fear. We're not going to change. You know, Sumner doesn't like the Internet. Sumner doesn't want his content on the Internet. And, you know, they've done some th- stuff along the way. But it's been one step forward, you know, two steps forward, one step back. So, you know, um, Jason Hirschhorn, who was a former Viacom executive, has just been blogging and tweeting and Facebooking relentlessly about how much Viacom needs new leadership. And meanwhile, at CBS, Fortune ran an interview where um, Moonves was talking about how he sees the flagship, the CBS network. And basically, what he says makes a ton of sense. CBS in the future is a broad distribution channel, you know, like Netflix or Hulu. And you can get it free, you can get it with cable, and now you can, you know, you can get it a la carte for six bucks a month. And he's pulling content out of things like the CW, and he's doing things like commissioning new Star Trek series. And basically, 
the brand CBS, if it stands for anything, is a bunch of expensive stuff to watch. Um, and that makes sense. It's, it's, the, it's the only thing that makes sense for CBS. Um, and uh, he said something very smart. He said, you know, when I started in this job 20 years ago, shows you know, how long we've all been doing this anyway, that the company was driven on advertising. Now advertising is becoming a lot less important. And he called it interactive, by which he means subscription, is becoming a lot more important. And I think that, is, that with the Google thing, the, the key point here is advertising will still exist, but it's going to be a smaller piece of the video industry revenue pie moving forward. So time for one last thing. Um, the Go90 guys uh, re reorganized their offering and announced that, you know, explain to me their... So, so he, we, the, and this is, you know, we've talked about both Go90 and the issue. So go, if you watch Go90 on a Verizon cell phone, the the bandwidth is not going to count against your data. It's a big deal. It's a big deal because it suddenly means that um, watching video on Go90 is cheaper and better than watching it on any other network uh, you know, that you could get on your phone if you want to watch TV on your cell phone. Um, and it has huge implications for the policy, for net neutrality, if that's what you want, or fast lane. And it, it continues to raise the question, um, is it okay for content providers to subsidize bandwidth costs? And lots of people say no. You know, and I'm not, I'm, I am quite sure it's going to be a bigger and bigger debate because the economics make that, you know, those sorts of deals logical from a business point of view. So if we want to ban them, it's going to take some work by society to go do that. Um, but but you th but just so I understand kind of where you come on this, you think this is a good play for, for Verizon? Well, I, I mean, I think it is obviously a good play for Verizon because they're bundling, right? And there's a taking advantage of of something that they have you know, monopoly access to, um, which is, you know, half the cell phone market in the country, um, to um, compensate um, for, um, you know, being a late entrant to some degree into the video distribution business. Now, they can argue AT&T recent, you know, which bought DirecTV said, if you subscribe to DirecTV, you get unlimited data on your cell phones. It's less related, so there's less of a net neutrality issue, but it, um, from somebody looking at different offers, you know, you might see one or the other as more attractive. But from a, from a user's point of view, I like getting stuff free. From a content producer's point of view, I don't want to be at a disadvantage. The last thing I want is for digital video to look like cable, where I've got to go you know, grease a lot of palms before I can get it on everyone's screen. So, and on that note, the image of you with a grease gun in your hand, we'll leave that for the week. Uh, have an excellent hacking week, and uh, we will be back again next week with more hacking TV. Hack on. Keep on hacking. <laughs>